Queen Vix looked like a f***ing cathedral, all posh gargoyle-topped stone, mahogany-covered libraries, and pink-haired student intellectuals arguing about politics as they spilled out of the elegant gateways. This was the post-Columbine era. Goths were taken seriously then as a genuine threat to society. If you want to understand what that poem did, you need to hear what the poem said. Now, I warn you, you'd better instill yourself for the rest, because I'm pulling no punches, just like I pulled none in the original. So hello you beautiful people and welcome back to the next chapter of the Nostalgia Project. As usual I will leave the playlist linked below if you have missed the previous chapters because the last chapter was a sweet little happy teenagers in love in 2001 kind of thing and the two chapters before that were very high drama so you might want to catch up on those before you get to this one. This chapter is somewhere in the middle and does contain some really quite dark moments including something very gory, but the text does warn you that it's upcoming, so if you want to skip something really, really gory, uh, it, the warning will be there, and I will put the timestamp below or on the screen or both, um, so you can zap over it if you would like to. And I just have to jump in here to warn you that the poem truly is the most grotesque, over-the-top, gory, revolting, inappropriate thing you can possibly imagine. I have actually cut a chunk out of it and that will only be in the written version of this, of this project. I did not want to bring it to YouTube at all because the world I wrote this poem in was a very different world to the world we live in today. Uh, I wrote this poem in the very beginning of September 2001. Does that date ring any bells? Um, we were standing on the precipice of a very different world and to write this subject matter or to even read this subject matter in today's world is especially inappropriate. As such, if you are remotely touchy as many people rightly are these days, about the subjects of violence, murder, death, etc. If, if any of that gets to you, please, please, please skip the poem and just know, look, it was lurid, it was over the top, it was gross, you don't need to hear it, okay? Uh, the timestamp will be on the screen, so if you want to skip over it, just feel free. It, it is not necessary for you to bathe in the bloodbath of my ridiculous teenage nonsense. Um, <laughs> it's not vital to the story, but I just wanted to warn you, dude, it's bad, okay? So um, timestamp on screen if you want to skip, okay? Something I do need to clarify before we start, when I say college, um, what I am talking about in the UK in 2001 was sixth form college. So this was something you went to when you were 16 turning 17. It was just after you'd finished school at 16, because we used to finish school at 16 back then, get in! And um, <laughs> so college was what you did before university. So when English people say university, they basically mean what American people mean by college. It's very confusing. Using. So college was supposed to be for two years from 16 to 18 and then you go to university or college if you're American when you're 18. Does that make any sense? I hope that explains it. So I was 16 at this point going to this thing that was supposed to last two years but was voluntary. Like school, compulsory schooling ended at 16. And I guess there is not much else for me to say on the beginning of this little introduction, so I guess we will get to the story. So this chapter is simply called Queen Vix College, aka The Perfect Storm. <laughs> and uh, here we go. Ugh. So I told you about the summer. I told you it was perfect. But that was another lie. When you're as broken as we were, Ash and me, it takes a long, long time before anything's even okay. Summer 2001 was all jagged edges and polar feelings. Blissfully in love, but acutely depressed. Licking the sugar off my first adult freedoms, but still only 16 years old. That sudden total openness with Ash, all based on one huge reckless lie. And now I'm 35. When I look back on the summer of 2001, it's like a bowl of childhood lucky charms, 
the good bits always float to the surface first. Ask any 35-year-old, we rose-tint everything. I'm not so far gone as to tell you my school days were the best days of my life yet, but I know where all that f comes from now. We just want to be young again, with an endless future and all those choices ahead of us. Getting older's like walking up this corridor lined in doors. At first, every single one of them's open. So many doors opening into rooms full of staring people. It's terrifying. There's so much choice, too much. You could be anything, they all scream. You could do anything. And the only trouble is that you have no answer. How should you pick who or what to be when you could be anything? By the time you're my age, though, the corridor you're walking down is narrow and dim, and most of the doors are slammed in your face. The future you head towards is an inevitability made from choices you never even realised were choices. Like you were sitting an exam all your life, but no one bothered to tell you. And now your grades are out, and what you're left with is all you'll ever have. I'm pretty happy, really, with what I have, but... I still miss the choices, the possibilities, the imagining. I guess what I'm saying is that I didn't mean to do it. Lie to you, I mean. The good bits just floated to the top first. I poured you out this summery Pim's cocktail, then after you went home, I realised there was still half a jug of black sludge sitting there, still waiting to be poured. You didn't get the mixed cocktail. I knew it didn't taste right. It certainly didn't taste true. So here's the rest of it. Everything that led up to the perfect storm. The first element was depression. Never underestimate an unstable teenager. Ash was four years ahead of me and his family were a lot more switched on about mental health than mine were. I mean, fuck, they had to be, didn't they? After Ash's dad died. So when he realised how depressed I was, which was hardly difficult to see, given the constant severe self-harming, he told me I should get on antidepressants. They're not brilliant, Ash said, but they're better than nothing. So we booked an appointment at my doctor's surgery, and Ash came in with me. We told the doctor how depressed I was, that I needed pills or therapy, ideally both. And the doctor said, I can put you on a waiting list for a psychiatrist, that'll take a few months to come through. Can we get pills? I asked timidly. In my family, you didn't take pills unless it was terminal. You certainly didn't take pills for something that was only in your head. But Ash was on them. He didn't seem as depressed as me, so I pressed just something for now. No, the doctor stated offhand, already reading something on her desk. That's the psychiatrist's job. I'll refer you to him. The waiting list is presently three months long. Three months, Ash echoed back, incredulous, as he gestured at the cuts on my bared left arm. You're just going to do nothing about this for three months. Do you really think she can wait that long, like this? <laughs> I wanted to kiss him. I never had the balls to speak up for myself like that, like anything. If Ash wasn't there, I would have just nodded, walked out, then butchered myself all over again. Teachers, parents, employers... Beware the kid that always seems a little too relaxed when it comes to criticism, to being fucked over. The kid that nods and smiles so politely, no matter what you dump on their head, no matter how f***ing awful the day is. It might seem like they don't have any emotions at all. Nothing but politeness and chill all the way down to the bottom like a stick of rock, but trust me, that's bullshit. They have too many emotions. So many that if they showed you even a hint, you'd probably lock them up forever. That's why they just nod and smile, nod and smile, take it, take it all, then come back in tomorrow wearing long black sleeves. But not when Ash was around. He fought for me. He was amazing. But it made no difference. The psychiatrist has to prescribe the pills, the doctor repeated, like we were slow in the head. 
I do not do that. The waiting list is three months long. Nothing I can do. Shut the door on your... She's suicidal half the time, Ash argued, refusing to be shooed out of the room. She won't be here in three months. What the hell? Nothing I can do, said the doctor, still not looking up from the papers on her desk. Shut the door on your way out. Oh, this is mental, Ash erupted as we got up to leave. If she dies, it's on you. You personally. He was furious as we walked down the echoing linoleum corridor, hand in hand. To me, though, it seemed like nothing more than the typical sort of chord played in the bad luck ballad that had accompanied my entire life. I told you so, I said, pulling a face. They are useless round here. Even when I got to see that therapist a year ago, she was utter sh**. But this is medication, Ash pointed out, exasperated. It's not difficult. They just work out that you're bloody miserable all the time, then they dish you out the happy pills. That was insane. I don't know if I can do three months like this, I said in a very small voice. It was somehow easier around Ash, to be honest, instead of accepting it oh so politely, then going home and butchering myself. He wouldn't have stopped me if that was what I needed to do. Maybe that's what made it easier. I could say anything, literally anything, and it was okay with Ash. And he was older. He knew stuff about the world I didn't. Antidepressants had never even crossed my mind before I met him. Such was the culture of my family. How am I meant to do three months? I whispered. Like this, when you said the pills take two weeks to even start working and... My voice cracked and I shut up, shaking the hair over my face as we emerged onto the windy September street. Ash pulled me to a stop, brushed the hair and tears from my eyes, and after a thoughtful moment, he said, We're not doing that shit. You can't wait three months. We'll go to my place, my doctor's. If we put you on the records as living at my mum's, you'll be in the catchment area. It'll be fine. They'll sort you out, I swear. You're not waiting three months. F*** these idiots. So that's exactly what we did. Without even telling my parents or his, I moved legally speaking, across the county to Ash's mum's place. Their little country doctor's practice had room for one small teenage patient, and I have no idea if lying to them was even legal, but no questions were asked, and it was just a few days later that we repeated the same exercise with vastly different results. A prescription was written, and off we went to the chemist across the road to pick up my very first happy pills. There's the postcode lottery for you. To this day, I'm enrolled at a surgery miles away from my home because posh countryside practices give considerably more f***s about their patients than those busy town centre ones. We were pretty jubilant. (laughs) Anything had to be better than how I felt now. And after the bullshit we'd encountered at the first doctor's office, then the illicit fiddling of my address, it felt like we'd just pulled off Grand Theft Auto. As we walked through the quiet little square to the chemist, Ash joked about the proper Prozac versus generic brand Fluxetine. He said he preferred the proper ones because they had much happier looking packaging and he wanted all the placebo effect he could get. Thank you very much. So there it was, my first packet of plasticky sludge coloured green and yellow pills to be taken first thing in the morning, every day, effects not to be judged for the first two weeks. That was the instructions they gave you back then and maybe it's the same now, maybe it isn't. I've certainly seen a lot of studies about Prozac being basically horse but that was how I got my first ever antidepressants, and with typically timing, I got them just as summer was ending and college was about to begin. So when it came to all that, colleges, I mean, in my hometown, there were two. There was the absolute reeking sh- hole that took any imbecile who landed face first on its doorstep and then there was Queen Victoria's sixth form. Queen Vix looked like a f***ing cathedral, all posh gargoyle topped stone, mahogany covered libraries and pink haired student intellectuals arguing about politics as they spilled out of the elegant gateways. In my family, if you didn't get into Queen Vix, you might as well go straight out and top yourself. No kid in our family was stooping low enough to attend the other one. 
My GCSE results weren't exactly star-spangled, given I'd been depressed as fuck, distracted by loving Ash, and too nihilistic to rein in my angry tangent rants during essays, but I guess I'm judging them by the perfectionist standards of my family, not by the standards of sanity, because they were good enough to get me into Queen Vic's. Even though this was a choice, that college would shortly come to regret like hell. So there we were. The summer was over. The freedom was over, and I was starting college tomorrow morning. I'd said a long, lingering, depressing train platform goodbye to Ash, and now I was back home. Stuck once more in my shitty little hometown where all the bullies lived, ready to launch back into the educational pursuits I'd loathed with a fiery f***ing passion for the past five years, and now... Now, my attendance wasn't even compulsory. It was optional. Going through educational hell was a choice I would have to personally make all by myself every single day. What could possibly go wrong there? When the alarm went off at 7am, it was a bloody rude surprise after an entire summer of lounging round sleeping all day in Ash's arms, but I got out of bed regardless because this was serious sh- you only got one first impression, and if I was going to a new college full of new kids, kids who weren't the dumb shit cabbage-brained morons who'd slouched through the corridors of my last educational establishment, then I damn well had to get my first impression right. And by right, I mean goth as f- On went the long black velvet lace and gypsy bells skirt I'd worn for my first date with Ash, topped with the Sisters of Mercy hoodie I'd bought at the gig where I had my first kiss. My ever-present rubber bondage collar, stompy black new rocks, crimped hair, and enough eyeliner to make a panda think it might have gone a touch overboard. Then I took my Prozac and started the long uphill march to college, my disc man gripped in one hand, playing a CD Ash had burned for me, mingling ultraviolence with the merry thoughts, Cubanet, VMV Nation, Apoptigma Berserk, and Wolfsheen. You had to walk very, very carefully when listening to a disc man. The tiniest jolt sent the CD skipping madly all over the place. Walkmans were better, frankly, but cassettes were such a hassle with all that rewinding and fast-forwarding. Most kids in 2001 used a disc man, despite how vast, practical, and genuinely shit the things were. When I'd found my bemused, anxious way to the college, I rapidly located my school friend Lorna, who was literally the only decent soul to enter my old high school and make it out the other side whole and undamaged. I also discovered, however, that a displeasing proportion of the bully kids I'd hoped would be too dumb to get in had, in fact, got in. Great. A whole summer of being whoever the f*** I liked, reinventing myself as part of the Birmingham goth scene, all of them accepting me as who I wanted to be, as Little Nothing, my net name of that era. All of that was about to be flushed unceremoniously down the bog. I was happy being nothing, the baby of the scene. Ash's conjoined twin in that whirlwind world of clubs and pubs and piercings and sex. But now, now I was back here, in the scum town, being treated like a kid again with my old reputation as the untouchable garbage bin glued firmly to my forehead. Even worse than any of that, it turned out that everything I'd been told about college was a massive lie, because the government had just made changes to college education that very year, as though in specific insult to me personally. Inserting a shit ton of extra classes dubbed key skills, which meant that one third or more of your time spent in college Time that used to be free study periods was now spent taking classes you had not chosen, that did not interest you, but that, just like in school, you had to tolerate because the government said it would make you a well-rounded individual. Except, well, it's like I said, isn't it? This was college. Nothing was truly compulsory. The government couldn't make you do anything, not anymore. 
any second of any day you could stand up, hurl your pens across the room, yell fuck this fucking place, man, and walk out forever. And the second I learned how much of my time would be taken up on these nonsensical, dull, pointless key skills classes, my brain started nibbling away at that idea with the gluttonous compulsion of a rat with a fresh dish of poison. The first day wasn't any easier than the average school day, I guess. A bit of bullying, a lot of boredom, and a big old form to fill in regarding health issues, allergies, and medication. I put down that I was on Prozac for depression and handed the thing back in. And when it came to that Prozac, I was actually starting to notice it, but not like an antidepressant. Ash had forewarned me that when he'd started on it, he'd get all these rushes of manic energy, usually followed by having to leg it to the bathroom and dry heave for a couple of minutes. I didn't get the yakking, thank God, but I definitely got the manic energy. On every single one of my school report cards, it said that I was quiet in class, overly reluctant to participate in class discussion, but once I'd popped a few Prozac, that all changed. It was like being on a bucket load of speed. Not that I knew it yet, given I'd never touched the stuff, but any time anyone was talking about anything and there was a pause, the briefest fucking interlude in the talking, I was in there. It didn't matter if they were talking about politics, churches or creative writing. I suddenly had an opinion about everything and everyone had to hear it. Random ideas blurted out in the middle of lectures, which actually swung me through my first government and politics classes with unexpected aplomb. Fuck only knows why I chose that class. I wanted nothing to do with politics. I just love the manic street preachers, and I wanted to know about politics well enough to pen furious, eloquent, lacerating missives about the destruction of the system and how it was poisoning us all, and for that I needed to understand how it all worked. I needed to know the names of the bastards who were really fucking shit up so I could hate them with the right sort of fiery, verbose passion. I guess I'd expected the rest of the 16-year-olds choosing government and politics to be the same brand of anti-establishment fireball. But what actually happened was that I landed myself among an entire roomful of politically ambitious Tory boys. They didn't want to destroy the system, rant about the system. They wanted to enter the system. They wanted to be local MPs and fucking prime ministers and health secretaries and all the rest of that intolerable bollocks. And the real trouble with that was they actually understood the system already. And not just the bits the Mannix ranted about, Nazi Germany and the plague of Etonite tax-evading aristocrat tossers. Hell no, they understood proportional representation and the first-past-the-post system and all the rest of that tedious shit that an angry goth slash punk high off their tits on Prozac has absolutely no patience for learning about. So the side effects of those pills giving me the first few furious verbal uppercuts due to the faux speed turning my mouth into a gurning savage nearly made up for the fact I didn't know jack shit. Whoever speaks first controls the dialogue. Always remember that. I could establish the things I did know and hide everything I didn't. But not from myself. For me, it was blindingly obvious that I was a fish out of water in this place, and pretty soon, everyone would notice the spluttering. The next class I chose was sociology. This was because I'd met a really cute pink-haired boy at open day, who was wearing the leopard print shirt uniform of a Mannix fan, and he'd gone on and on with these beautiful, eloquent words about how sociology helped you understand people, society, why it did all the dumb things it did, and he was so intelligent and well-spoken and furious, and I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be in a class full of people like him. So I signed up, and then it turned out to be this tedious, studious garbage my speedy little mind couldn't handle, and after that the only class left was English. Thank God for English. 
I'd won the prize in that over the rest of my primary school when I was 11, and if there was anything I could pass with minimal effort, it would always, always be English. The first assignment they set us was to write a poem, with the theme of it being a journey. Any sort of journey we liked. I was psyched. We had about a week to complete it. That was cool. Lots of time to think and plan and write and edit. But after that, after the first couple of days, it all just blurs. All I have now is this faded velvet pouch filled with the shards of miserable memories, tossed out into my palm in no logical order whatsoever, lethally sharp, jagged edged, tinged with dried teenage blood. So here they are, piece by piece. I remember the inability to eat at college. The lunch hall was where all the popular kids hung out, and that meant bullies galore. It also meant a lot of people crowded around staring at you. How was I meant to eat in there? I'd never ever eaten in the lunch hall at school. We'd always taken our sandwiches out into the woods or a classroom. I even hated restaurants for the public charade of all that eating, so fuck the dining hall. I wasn't going in that place at all if I could help it. So I'd go to one of the pie and pasty coffee shops nearby, get a vegetarian pasty and a cup of coffee, and sit down at the grease smudged metal table alone until I was told that what I had didn't classify as a meal, therefore I couldn't sit on their premises to eat it, even though the place was half empty. Fucking twats, I thought, but I didn't say it out loud, the faux speed wasn't quite that strong. I was forced back out into the shopping centre, but I couldn't eat and walk. People were looking at me, it felt awful. So in the end, the only thing I could think was to go into the town centre toilets, which were disgusting. Piss all over the floor, leaky plumbing, those gross metal toilet seats with a gap right at the centre, and a narrow low to the ground bowl to keep you as uncomfortable as possible and no lid at all, so if you sat, you had to sit right on the pissing seat. The stools were narrow, graffiti smudged, depressing, faded blue-grey and filthy, but finally there was no one looking at me. This was the only place private and quiet enough to acceptably eat, so that's where I ate. Sitting on a filthy toilet seat, listening to people taking dumps to the left and the right. I'd eat my pasty and drink my coffee and take my time doing it. I'd always rather deal with foul smells and grime than the all-round assault of being out there in the town centre, surrounded by other people. It pretty quickly became a routine, eating my lunch alone in the toilet stool. After a couple of weeks, though, I discovered the library. Not the college library that had kids in it, bullies. Here there be monsters. Instead I went to the town's public library, and on the days I got really lucky, the disabled toilet was unlocked, so I could eat in a big, plush, clean white toilet instead of a filthy, shit-stained toilet, and I could even stay in there as long as I liked. Genuinely, that's what I did. I basically hid in toilets for the entirety of my college education. And when I found a toilet that was big and clean, it was like I'd rented Buckingham Palace for the afternoon. Peace and quiet, and nobody looking at me, and a mirror to boot. A mirror to see myself in. To look into my own eyes and know for sure that I still existed. That I was here and that the mirror girl was here with me too. I've always had a weird relationship with mirrors. They ground me. Looking into your own eyes is looking into the eyes of the only person who will ever truly get you. She, he, it. They know all your secrets, your failures, your successes. And if you were a lonely kid like me, maybe your reflection also became a whole other person. A person you talk to like there's two of you. To this day, I call myself we. I've caught myself doing it in vlogs, even. No one ever notices. I guess you assume I mean me and you guys. We. I don't. I mean me and the other me. The one I talk to 24-7. And have done since I was about six years old. 
that's a whole story in itself and we'll get there soon enough but if I'm anxious in a public place my favorite place to be is always a bathroom with a mirror my other self gets it of course they do they get everything I'm feeling and they make suggestions look just tolerate another half hour of this shithole then we'll get out of here okay what have we got at home right now any morphine no fuck We've got a decent stash of methadone though, so I say we do 30 more minutes, then we fuck off. We drink every drop of it and pretty soon we won't care about any of this. Yeah, <laughs> I know. These people are goddamn unbearable. You'll see. We'll write them into a story as soon as we're high, turn them all into murder victims or something. So while you're out there, just keep noticing stuff, okay? Stuff about them to put in the story. 30 more minutes. See you soon once more into the fucking breach. The breach of flaming prats. That's the kind of thing me and the mirror girl talk about, talk like, but back then there was no morphine or methadone. All either of us had to comfort us was a razor blade and the thought of seeing Ash at the weekend. Even the mirror girl didn't have a fix for this situation. It sucked. Whole thing sucked. College was every bit as miserable as school, maybe even more so, for the bitter, chafing knowledge that it wasn't the man keeping me there. It was me, my own goddamn choice. It was me gripping tight to the razor wire that sliced me open because I wanted to? It didn't make sense. So me and the mirror girl, we stayed in that library a long, long time, day after day, once the toilets got boring and the library itself was quiet enough to seem safe, we ventured in there and first we found Sylvia Plath, read all her poetry. We'd already read The Bell Jar a thousand times, but there were some poems that were new to us, or to me, I, I guess, sorry. We've slipped into our plural. Mirror me gets more potent when we're anxious and have just escaped the other people and finally there's no one to interrupt the intimacy of our relationship. It's so, so much better to be alone with the mirror girl where we're an us than it is to be alone in a crowd down there on the street, surrounded on all sides by other people. Mirror me can't exist down there. Only in solitude, which means that out there I truly am alone, an I, not a we. The library was an okay compromise. So I flicked through some art books about tattoos and piercings, went back to Plath. Finally, it would come time to leave, maybe to catch the final class of the day, so I could say I'd actually kind of been, or sometimes just because college was over, so I could go home at the right time and not catch shit for ditching. But while I was hiding out in the library or the town centre toilets, I was also writing. Writing that poem they'd asked me for, remember? The Journey. I wish like hell I still had a copy of that thing, but I don't. It was handwritten. I gave them the only copy I had, but I still remember the subject matter vividly. How could I not, after the flailing shitstorm, that poem unleashed? The journey I wrote about was my walk through town to college. Sounds innocent enough, but if you're squeamish, here's where you're gonna wanna jump forward a bit. I wrote about getting up in the morning, slipping my arms into the soft velvet embrace of my trench coat, bulky with weapons plugging my disc man into my ears, then striding out into town. I described everything. The Woolworths, the WH Smiths, you knew exactly where I meant. Here. Right. Fucking here. In the poem, I slipped into the toilets to take a razor blade from my pocket, bare the pale skin of my left arm, then slit it open three, four, five times. I described the gashes in gruesome detail, brutal truth, that they weren't the cherry red blood smudges you see in movies, no. When you cut deep, for real, what you see first is this cold blue-white crevice like uncooked chicken, dotted with tiny yellow beads of fat cells, 
until the blood trickles crimson into that cold, dead gash from your severed blood vessels, fills the slice and trickles stickily down your arm. After that, they do look like movie wounds. Gorgeous crimson mouths gaping wide, pissing blood down your arm. So I took off my trench coat, tied it round my waist, strode out of those grotty little toilets where I'd eaten so many miserable lunches, bleeding, smiling and heavily armed. Now, I warn you, you'd better fucking steal yourself for the rest, because I'm pulling no punches, just like I pulled none in the original. If you want to understand what that poem did, you need to hear what the poem said. So if you're squeamish, again, look the fuck away. I walked back into the shopping centre. I described it all. The women, the children, the other students, and my burning fucking hatred for the lot of them. People were shit. People were bullies, their hearts full of nothing but hate. They were all chattel for the slaughter, thick as pig shit, full of dumb judgement, prejudice, bigotry and ignorance, all of them fat with their own self-importance. So I raised the muzzle of my gun and blasted the first shot into the face of one of those perma-grinning shitbags who'd ruined my life for the past five years, almost a third of the time I'd been on earth. His head exploded like a goddamn watermelon man, brains erupting out the back to splatter the window of W.H. Smith's, white and pink and grey all swirled with blood and gore, like a weird ice cream with way, way too much strawberry sauce. When the dumbly chewing cattle noticed, when the screaming started, it was music to my ears, blurring through the beat that pounded through my head. Move into my line of fire. I'm gonna break you. I'm gonna make you pay. I'm gonna break you. Your beauty on my skin like oxyacetylene, so move into my line of fire. The cattle were screaming, running, flailing. I just kept on walking blowing out kneecaps, bullets ripping through shoulders until gleaming white bone poked from the blood-gushing wreckage of so many gruesome bodies. The shopping centre stank of blood now, I could taste the metallic tang of their deaths, along with the fetid reek of bullet-ruptured bowels. When everyone was down, dead or dying, blood smearing the linoleum floor, screams fading to quiet moans or the guttural rattles of collapsed, punctured lungs. I turned the gun on myself and smiled up at the fluorescent lights. The world was finally over for me. Serenity, at last. The gaping cuts on my arm still stang, singing their euphoric razor-kiss adrenaline sizzle. The bullet shot from the chamber, straight into my brain, and at last, all of it was gone. Nothing mattered. I could sleep. And then, there was nothing. I'd say I was in peace, but it was just nothing. And that was better than any peace I could ever imagine. <laughs> and that was my journey. My poem. If you think this retelling was gross, over the top, gratuitous as fuck, sick making even, I can guarantee to you had nothing on the original. Every troubled teen creative loves to shock, and I'd seen enough snuff movies on the early internet to know how death looked, how it really looked. And I poured it all into those pages, with no thought to consequence. It was creative writing, wasn't it? You wrote about all the stuff you'd never, never dare do in reality. Wasn't that the whole point? Who bothered writing about the everyday stuff when you were forced to live it? This was what I found interesting. This was the fantasy my mind always drifted to every day as I stomped to college, Cubanet blasting through my headphones, move into my line of fire. I visualised them all dying, a cleaner world, a better world, an escape. But that's all it was, man. A visualisation, a wild escapist fantasy, however dark. So I handed in the poem, feeling pleased. Pleased with my work. 
until the next day when my English teacher held me back as everyone else left. Her eyes were tight with a strange sort of strained smile as she said she wanted to talk to me about my poem. I wondered if I was getting another award or something. <laughs> but she knew I was on Prozac from the form I'd filled in and I was visibly a goth. And this was the post-Columbine era. Goths were taken seriously then as a genuine threat to society. She mentioned the self-harm in the story. Was that real? I said, yeah, it was. Maybe I even showed her my scars. The speediness of that fucking Prozac crippled my ability to register consequences, to think before I acted. So I yanked down the black band on my arm and showed her all those gaping gashes. That was probably a bad move. I just proved to her that a good portion of my poem was the actual truth. So what about the rest of it? Was that true too? It was bloody obvious she feared it was. Her next questions involved violence. Whether I ever got involved in violent altercations, I said no, laughed my ass off. I'd barely been in a fight in my life. Nonetheless, she asked if the poem was a plan. Was I going to do this? I laughed even harder. I was in England, you moron. Where the fuck was I getting a gun from? I probably even said that, which wasn't the best move either. I hadn't denied my intent, not at all. Merely my present lack of capability and, well, where there's a will, maybe there's a way? When I realised this, saw the look on her face, I backpedalled hard, pointing out that this was all just creative writing. It was imagination. And the thing I wanted to imagine was being inside the head of a mass murderer. <laughs> it was a rare experience, wasn't it? That made it interesting. That made it worthy of creative exploration. Where was the fucking problem? Well, the fucking problem was that in 2001, goths were viewed as unhinged, unstable mass murderers, and my English teacher had just been handed the most violently murderous missive she'd ever seen in her life, penned by the Prozac-popping, self-harming, unknown quantity of a new goth kid who lurked at the back of the class, bar her random impulsive explosions of rapid-fire, aggressive, Prozac-induced ranting that showed zero impulse control or regard for others, so that was that. It was official. I was not just a danger to myself, but also a danger to others. And that meant I was off to the equally shell-shocked, but trying hard not to show it, headmistress. Barely two weeks in and I was already on report. My teachers were to watch me in lessons wherever I went, passing round a book to document my behaviour. And once a week, I had to report back to the headmistress to be evaluated based on my testimony and that of my teachers. In truth, I was a hair's breadth from being expelled, but at the time, it seemed nothing more than amusing nonsense. All this because the normal adults couldn't understand my sense of humour. How fucking ridiculous. But that was just the culture of the time. If I'd been blonde normal looking. You and I both know they'd have suspected trouble at home, that I was a victim of abuse, that this was a cry for help. I probably would have been sent to counselling, but because I was a goth, they just feared me. I was demonised and there was no help provided, only suspicion. There was no thought as to why I might be so sick in the head. <laughs> no, the only consideration was to protect the rest of them. The normal ones. The fucking bullies from me. It was bullshit. They had the chance to help, really help, a kid who was clearly miserable to the point of suicide, and instead they simply saw that kid as a grenade to fling as far away as possible. But for all my desires to be a Richie Edwards-esque fireball of eloquent wrath, my 16-year-old self just didn't see this inequality, this injustice, this bullshit. As usual, I just took it. 
laughed it off, let it go. And so the miserable college days rolled on. I'd almost stopped eating because there was nowhere to do it bar those filthy toilets. Everything made me too anxious. Plus the Prozac really was like speed. My stomach felt weird, like tight and cold. I couldn't force food into it. More and more, I left the house, but somehow didn't quite wind up at college. Sometimes I slipped onto the wrong bus, rode it all the way to the shopping mall, then wandered aimlessly round the fluorescent linoleum halls. I stole Barry M eyeshadows from Superdrug because nothing mattered and I didn't care if I got caught. And they were overpriced as shit anyway. No one caught me. On the weekends, when I saw Ash, he talked a lot about autumn. We were crawling towards it, and though autumn for me just meant the sludgy misery of a long school term, to him it meant Whitby Gothic weekend. Ash had a hotel room booked and a lift with a friend, so was I coming? I wanted to. Of course I wanted to. It was the seminal Gothic experience and everyone was going. So on Monday I went to college and tried to book the necessary days off. They wouldn't let me do it. Not without a good reason. And I mean a good reason like somebody fucking dying. This was serious bullshit. I already hated this fucking place. And now they were trying to curtail every last trace of the beautiful life I'd carved out for myself this whole goddamn summer? Fuck these assholes. But what could I do at that point? Drop out? Hardly. My parents would shit. I would never hear the end of it. It might be my choice on paper, but in reality, I was every bit as trapped as I'd been at school. Until, that is, the bomb finally dropped. Like I said, Ash's mum had absolutely, utterly, 100% had it with us. Ash and me, shagging all over her house no matter what she did to stop us, she couldn't hack it anymore. He was 20 years old and he didn't listen to a word, she said. His sexual antics were a terrible influence on her youngest daughter and she wanted him out. Out of her fucking house completely. Should have been a catastrophe for both of us, for him especially. Where else was he meant to live? In his tiny car? In the crapped out caravan round the back of the farmhouse? <laughs> of course not. Ash's family were hardly broke, were they? Taylor liked her shit expensive. It wasn't like she was going to make her only son homeless. Quite the opposite, in fact. Ash's mum was so desperate for peace, quiet and a lack of soggy condoms on the floor, she was buying him a literal house. His own place. That was the punishment for his lewd behaviour. I guess this is the way rich people deal with their rebellious offspring? And honestly, as ass-backwards and demented as it sounds, I'd like to point out that most of those offspring turn out just fine. So remember that, next time you hear that bullshit line about it being better to make your kid homeless than enable them, everyone needs space, comfort, stability to work out their issues. That's my take. Few people go up in the world once they're living on the street. So that was that. <laughs> Ash was becoming a goddamn homeowner. And once he knew it, knew he was getting a place of his own, well, it was obvious, wasn't it? He knew how unhappy I was in that town, at that college, that I was already skipping most of my classes, that I'd likely never make it through the term, let alone two years. Except I had no clue how to tell my family that. So he asked me to move in with him and I didn't even have to think about it. I said yes, straight away. I hadn't asked my parents, but when did I ever? Agreeing to move in with Ash was the easy bit, the beautiful bit. Like that Beach Boys song, wouldn't it be nice? To sleep the whole night through and still wake up together every single day. No parents, no college, no sex police, just us. But once I came down off that cloud nine, that was when I realised there was a huge, rocky, difficult side to all this. Because now, 
Now I had to tell my parents. Had to tell them all of it. Not just that college was down the shitter, but that I was moving out at age 16. And I'd never been good at that shit. Serious conversations with authority figures? I had one tactic, and one tactic only. I picked a fight right outside my room, then stormed through the door, slammed it in my mum's face, slumped against it to keep her out, and yelled everything through that closed door. It doesn't matter anyway! I'm ditching college and I'm moving in with Ash! College? My mum sputtered. Moving out? What's brought this on? No one understands me here, I wailed like an absolute teenager. I have clinical depression and I'm on Prozac and the only thing that makes me happy is being away from here with him. So that's what I'm doing. Prozac, she echoed, clearly more horrified by a safe legal mental health medication than she was by any of the rest of it. You don't need to be on medication for being unhappy, Dorian. You should have just talked to us. We could have tried telling that to my chemical imbalance, I screamed through tears and snot. You don't understand. I've been telling you all my life that I'm never, ever happy and you just, you just laugh at it. Oh, come on, she snapped, finally losing her rag too. When did I ever laugh at you being unhappy? I assumed the best mocking tone I could through the aforementioned tears and snot. Oh, Dorian, it's no wonder you have no friends when you walk around with a face like that. Real sympathetic, Mum. You do not understand what it's like. I hate college and I hate this town. I always have, so I'm getting out, OK? And you can't stop me. I'm 16 and I'm moving in with Ash. The argument probably continued round and round in circles that... Medication for mental illnesses was stupid and bizarre and unnecessary, that I'd never mentioned being unhappy at college like I ever talked to them about anything. Amazing that the college hadn't phoned them either, considering the poetry debacle. Once again, just how wrong was it that that college had received a poem disturbing enough to be perceived as a genuine violent threat from a 16-year-old kid Yet never once had they sought to ensure that that kid's home life was safe or stable. Queen Vix, so prestigious, but not caring. Never that. I think it was all sorted out pretty quickly, though. Me moving out, or maybe I've just blacked out a full week of stress and arguments to protect my own goddamn psyche. Alternately, maybe no amount of stress at home could bother me. Now I actually had a light at the end of the tunnel. All I knew was that I was going to Whitby Gothic weekend very, very soon. And the minute I got back, well, when I got back, I was moving in with Ash. We'd have our own place, our own little haven. It's going to be perfect. So I went into college, grinning for once went directly to the front desk. They recognised me, that weird goth kid back to cause more problems. I'd been there about taking those days off at least three times, trying to find some way around their bullshit. As such, felt good. Really fucking good. To tell them they could stuff it all right up their asses now, because I didn't even need the time off, not anymore. I was quitting. I was free forever. Take this job and shove it. I don't work here anymore. I had to go and see the headmistress one last time because I was still on report and I had to sign all that off. Tell them I wouldn't be a big scary menace threatening their delicate little clutch of bullies anymore because I was gone. Bye bye She was nice though, actually, that day. I was clearly a kid with issues. She even told me I could come back next year if I wanted to, if I just needed a break. Inside my head I snorted, thought, fat fucking chance. If I ever see this place again, it'll be too soon. And that was that. I walked out a free human. No school, no college, no job, no nothing. And that didn't scare me back then. Hadn't I just spent all summer doing nothing? And like I said, this was 2001. Kids had it easy. The economy hadn't crashed, not yet. So parents didn't concern themselves about kids taking gap years. It'd all be okay in the end. The plan was that I'd find work in the city, retail or something, whatever, who cared. 
Ash's new place was right by the train station, so yeah, we'd work something out. No one gave a shit about the details, I certainly didn't. I just needed to escape. No more hiding in filthy fucking toilets, nibbling greasy pasties in lacerating isolation and constant misery. I was free of the scum town at last. I celebrated with Ash, of course. Even though we were about to be parent-free and broke as all hell, we went to the goth mall in the city and bought more PVC clubwear. On the drive back to his mum's place, we had to take a detour to the salon his sister was working at just to drop something off. When we walked in, though, the place was utterly, eerily silent. No blow dryers, no girly gossip. The quietest salon in the entire world, or so we thought. It was quiet, but for the TV in the corner. Everyone was clustered round, staring at it, wide-eyed. They had to explain it all to us. It was crazy. A fucking aeroplane had crashed into one of the tallest buildings in New York City, and now it was stuck there, on fire, hundreds of feet up in the air. It, it looked insane. It was obviously an accident, a drunken pilot or God knows what, but it was the most bizarre accident in the history of flight. Anyway, the hubbub died down, we gave Lucy whatever it was she'd needed, and drove back to Ash's place. Only... when we got in, that same eerie silence greeted us. A muted house, no noise bar the distant babble of the TV. Ash's mum was staring at the screen in their red brick farmhouse kitchen, blanched white, hands pressed to her mouth. Something else had happened now in New York. There'd been another one, a second plane, crashing headlong into the building right next to the first one. It wasn't an accident, none of it. It was a declaration of war. All night the footage played on the grainy monitor of Ash's dimly lit bedroom. Explosions, screams, collapsing buildings, smoke-filled streets blown through with a debris scatter of printer paper, and the people jumping. Hand in hand they plummeted from the flames, thumping to the ground with a sound you'd never ever forget, and the screaming would rise anew. That footage looped all night on every single channel. Under our feet, the world shifted forever. That seemed like a place to leave it for this chapter. Um, yeah, my my memory of, of when things exactly happened with, with college is, is a bit here and there. Like, I feel like the whole thing was, was just so horrible. It's, it's just a blur of toilets and plath and <laughs> bullies and greasy pastries and 9-11 in, in the middle of it all, 9-11. Um, and uh, yeah, it, even, you know, even over here in England, it was like, you know, it literally every channel all night looped the same footage. And Ash is like we were we were staying at Ash's house that night at his mum's house. Um he didn't have his new place just yet. And she was like she was horrified that we'd been in the city while that was going on. She called her daughter back immediately from the salon she was working at and she was like, You guys are not going into the city like again anytime soon. It's not happening because nobody fucking knew. Nobody knew like is this gonna be everywhere in the world? Like what's gonna go on? And of course, terrorist attacks did start springing up all over the world and continue to this day and continue to develop in the ways that they happen. You know, they've gone from bombs to to the, the whole grab a great big van and ram it through a tr crowd thing that goes on now. And, and that was the beginning of all of it. And um, in a way, I feel kind of blessed to have experienced the world before all of this became a part of it when you didn't have to worry about things like that. Um, and obviously this was the world before the financial crash too, um, when, yeah, like me moving out at 16 with no plans whatsoever, just, yeah, I'll get a job somewhere, like, you know, move out, it'll be cool. Um, that was fine in those days. Like I said in, I don't know if it was the chapter before or the one before that, but just look at the, the media and the movies and stuff from from the late 90s to early 2000s, stuff like American Pie, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, everything is is 
like kids you know go to college or university or whatever and it's it's not about grades it's not about success it's about banging chicks and like having a good time and getting stoned and making memories and you knew your life would work out in the end that was what the boomers had grown up with and that was what they expected and then 9-11 boom and financial crash boom and the world is so different now and you have to be so serious about college and education and degrees and all of that but yeah so this story and yes the extremely grisly poem I wrote um it was a very different time it was a very very different time and it was a less serious world like say like shootings and stuff and terrorist attacks like these days I feel like to write a poem like that when there is so much death and so much killing around the world would be like tasteless and gross as fuck but back then like you you could be carefree about everything because it, like in England none of that stuff touched us um and yeah there'd been Columbine but um it, it was it felt quite distant until it really landed right in my lap in the ways that people responded to me as a goth that you didn't get fucked with <laughs> for starters you didn't get fucked with by other kids for a few years after Columbine particularly not if you wore a trench coat and you know what they considered like the Columbine aesthetic with the stompy boots and the trench coat if that was your aesthetic you you tended not to get fucked with because they thought you were unhinged and dangerous but if you looked like that to the adults and then you wrote something like I wrote uh and I have made a video about this before. I did make a video about that, but I didn't tell you exactly what was in the poem precisely. And this is my best retelling that I can give you. It was a poem, but it was kind of a prose poem. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it was it was brutal and gory because the other thing about the early internet was the snuff was all over it. If you were a young goth on the early internet, you will probably remember sites such as the YNC, Rotten, Ogrish.com. There were a lot of sites that were just gore and snuff and, you know, the things you would see, even though this was, you know, what, 20 years ago, like, you you still remember it. It sticks with you. It's horrible. Like, I, I don't recommend going looking for that stuff. The, the tagline to one of those sites was, can you handle life? And that was how I felt about it. It was like, you have to be able to look these things in the eye because they're a part of life. It's like, no, they're not. No, they're not. Hopefully you will live your life and probably you will live your life without ever having to see someone being murdered, right? So don't shove it in your face and put it in your dreams and you don't need to. But as a teenager, with, with that tagline, I felt like you have to be able to handle life. You can handle everything if you can look at this. It's like, you're just going to traumatise yourself unnecessarily. Don't be, don't be stupid. But um, it meant when it came to creative writing, I I could describe things the way that was kind of realistic and uh how did they not how did they not diagnose this kid with autism though like well, while all of this was going on like the fact that I couldn't eat around other people I was always hide I would rather eat in a shitty toilet like a literally shitty toilet I would rather eat there than around other people and then I write this poem and I I don't even have like the social skills to realize huh I don't think people are gonna like respond well to this poem I don't think people are gonna take well to this like to me it was like what's the problem like I, I literally socially it went over my head like th why is this a problem like how did they not see this kid was autistic and why did they not put me in therapy it was like okay we're gonna make sure you don't murder anyone but we're not gonna try and like look into why you like are having these disturbing fantasies and like I say, I really do think if it hadn't been for the goth thing, if they hadn't just gone, oh, you know, dark, crazy, crazy subculture, they're crazy, they're incurable, whatever. If I had have been like blonde and normal in a tracksuit, I feel like it would have been, OK, what's going on at home? Let's put you in therapy. What's what's going on? What's going on? Is your father OK? What's going on with him? It would have been stuff like that. And it wasn't. It was just like, OK, you're sick. We need to keep an eye on you. And, you know, you do anything else like this and you're out. Like no therapy, no looking into it. it was fucked anyway this is a bit of a waffle so i shall leave you alone ada i will see you soon with the chapter about moving out to ash's place and going to whitby gothic weekend the first time when i was 16 and oh my god it made such an impression on me really like it was such a seminal experience um being just 16 at like you know the biggest goth festival in the uk one of the biggest ones in the world at just 16 and it was yeah it really 
it really set certain beliefs I have about goth to this day and I, I'm excited to get to that chapter and, and telling you all about it and yeah moving out at 16 into Ash's place and uh what <laughs> what goes on when you're 16 years old and you're partner's crazy rich mom has basically just bought the pair of you a freaking house and you're just two basically two teenagers stuffed in a house together with with like no no idea how to cook for yourselves no idea how to look after yourselves and it's just the two of you and you're both deeply dysfunctional and uh yeah so that's that's the next chapter to come and i hope this chapter did not freak you out too hard with the poem and uh yeah like huge sympathies to anyone who was nearer to new york when 9 11 took place um because it you know we honestly i was too young to really get the severity and the seriousness new york seemed very far away to me at the time but even so like you could kind of feel the world changing under your feet um so to have, if you were a few years older and or you were closer to new york like that must have been like shit scary so um i hope that didn't bring back any bad memories um anna anyway the next chapter is more fun again so i'll see you soon with that one bye bye <laughs>